My name is Dawn Gifford Engel, and uh, my husband and I, 23 years ago, decided to start something called Peace Jam. And it's our program which allows young people to connect with Nobel Peace Prize winners and to learn how to become leaders themselves and to change the world. And um, we have been going for 21 years. We have 1.3 million young people who've participated in our program, and um, we're all over the world. So uh, it sounds like a big thing, right? Um, that's, that's our mission. But when we started, it was just a couple of factory worker kids from Detroit. You know, Yvonne and I are just a couple of factory worker kids from Detroit. And he had a big idea. And his big idea was uh, it came out of a summer of violence in Denver, Colorado, a lot of gang violence. And he is a passionate Bulgarian wild man, artist, the former lead singer of a punk rock band called the Ramrods, who are still infamous in Detroit, so you can only imagine how over the top they were, and a writer for Cream Magazine, and uh, he's very artistic, and he, as an artist, was living in the worst part of Denver, and uh, a place where there was a lot of gang violence that summer. The newspapers called it the summer of violence. And 13-year-olds were killing 14-year-olds, drive-by shootings, it was bad. And one day he saw somebody in his neighborhood, a young kid, 14 years old, carrying a gun. And he called the kid and his friends over and he said, what's going on? You're not in school anymore. I see you during the day. What's going on? And they said, well, we have a business and we have a turf to protect. And he goes, okay, you have a business. Maybe it's selling drugs. If you have a business, you have to be smart and you need to be in school. And they said, no, we're out of school. We don't care. He was really worried about them, so he kept talking, and he said, who's the president of the United States? And they said, I don't know, and I don't care, because he doesn't represent us. They were really disengaged, and but he kept talking to them. He was so worried, he kept talking and talking, and they stumbled over the topic of South Africa, because the miracle in South Africa had just happened. This peaceful transfer of power in South Africa had just happened. And these young people, they knew all about Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, they went off. They went on and on about how inspiring they were and they stood up to the man and they did it without violence and they got their country back. And Yvonne just had this big light bulb go off over his head and he said, wow, if we can put young people together with Nobel Peace Prize winners, maybe that energy that's going in a negative direction, it can go in a positive direction. Maybe their lives can be transformed. Nobel Peace Prize winners who are walking the talk, putting their lives on the line for peace around the world. These should be the roles, models that these young people have. And so he came and he started talking to me. And he started talking to me because I'm, the, I'm like the opposite of Yvonne. I'm a, a very linear. I'm an economist. I worked for Congress for 13 years. I was the youngest woman ever to be chief of staff for a U.S. senator. And when I was in Washington, D.C., I was one of the very first volunteers for the international campaign for Tibet. So I knew the Dalai Lama, right? So he came and said, we have to meet with the Dalai Lama. We have to meet with the Dalai Lama. Get us a meeting with the Dalai Lama. And he kept talking and talking and talking about this big idea. And finally, I said, OK. I will do it. We got the meeting with the Dalai Lama. And Yvonne said, great, when is the Dalai Lama coming to Denver? And I said, no, 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 no. No, we have to go to India. And he said, I have $1.72 in my checking account, um, which was true. So we had to borrow from money uh, from friends. And um, we went and flew to India. The Dalai Lama loved the idea. And he said, don't just work with me, though. Work with these other Nobel laureates. He gave us a list of seven others. And we went back to Yvonne's artist loft in Denver with no heat, asbestos hanging out of the ceiling. You know, we've got our coats on, it's cold, but we have a big idea and a telephone, and the Dalai Lama said yes. So we just cold called the rest of the Nobel Peace Prize winners, honest and truly. Hey, Desmond Tutu, this is Dawn from Denver. You don't know me, but we have a big idea, and the Dalai Lama said yes. And we were able to get eight Nobel Peace Prize winners to say yes, to be our board, right? Before we were incorporated, before we had any money, before we had a curriculum, before we had anything, we were just like two people who were so on fire with this idea that we got eight Nobel Peace Prize winners to agree to be our board. Um, and we asked them, 
10 years later at our 10th anniversary, why did you say yes to us? You know, and they said, well, it was a good idea, but it was a really hard idea. No one had ever brought all the Nobel laureates together like that before. And I figured if anybody could do it, it was those two crazy Americans who've been sitting on my front porch step for a week waiting for a meeting with me, right? And it's an example that we give to young people because passion matters, ideas matter, um, being tenacious really matters. And as you see here, um, we ended up uh, actually being married by Desmond Tutu. We, we were friends, we were colleagues, we started doing Peace Jam, we fell in love, and Desmond Tutu married us in his church in Cape Town, South Africa. And then at the end of the service, he pulled us aside and he said, now people who I marry, they never get divorced. So I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> so we are stuck with each other for all of eternity, but we're really happy about that. We're, we're, we're very, very happily married. And, um, and we're a great team. And we, we've now ourselves been nominated 17 times for the Nobel Peace Prize, so pretty incredible. And this is what we've been able to do so far. Um, we, it's almost up to 1.3 million young people who have participated in our year-long programming. What happens is young people study the life of a Nobel Peace Prize winner. They look at what's going on in their own community. They create a project to make things better in their own community or in some other part of the world. They get to spend a weekend working side by side by, with this Nobel Peace Prize winner whose life they've studied and present to them their project. Then they go out and do the project. They gather again and six months later and the cycle goes on year after year. So it's education, which is our curriculum, inspiration, which is a Nobel Peace Prize winners, and action, the most important part. It's easy to come up with a good idea. It's hard to implement a good idea. So we teach those skills so that young people can become empowered agents of change. And we have, oh, the slide needs to be updated, we're up to 33 million projects, um, and we're up to 145 countries for our One Billion Acts of Peace campaign. <laughs> Thanks. So we were doing a speech at, in um, Silicon Valley. We were at Microsoft headquarters. And we were doing a speech. And we got off stage. And somebody from Google came up to us. And it was Meng, Shade Meng Tan. Has anybody heard of Meng who started um, Search Inside Yourself and Meditation here at Google? And he said that he bowed to us. And he said, you're doing what I want to do. I want to create world peace. And I'm going to kidnap you and take you to some place where they have better food. And so, and so he did. He, he, he kidnapped us, put us in his car, drove us to Google, and we sat there for three, four hours. I mean, we, we just kept talking and talking. We were so excited about what could happen if, if we started working together. And so we were able to get... Google is our lead donor and tech developer for the Billion Acts of Peace campaign. It's incredible. We've had over 100... Googlers working on, and YouTubers working on uh, this project. We have uh, half a million dollars in Google AdWords budget every year, and it's been an extraordinary partnership. Um, and we are almost tripling every year. We're definitely going to make the billion goal. We were just Mountain View, at Mountain View doing our annual strategic planning meeting, and the camp campaign is going great. The campaign itself, the One Billion Acts of Peace campaign, has been nominated. Um, nine times for the Nobel Peace Prize, and we are up for the Nobel Peace Prize this year. So we'll cross your fingers, maybe on October 6th we will win, and even more people around the world will be, will be able to join the effort. But the idea is that, you know what, our governments, they're just polarized, or they're paralyzed, or they're not dealing with the really crucial issues that are facing humanity, so it's time for us to act ourselves. We're not going to wait any longer. We're going to get together um, businesses, nonprofits, universities, cities, towns, um, high schools, young people, old people, everybody, just a citizen's movement where we work on what the Nobel laureates have identified as the 10 key issues facing humanity, things like alleviating extreme poverty, access to clean water for everybody, um, ending racism and hate, rights for women and girls. So we have a campaign with a lot of high integrity moral leadership, and this is what we're focused on doing, implementing our transformational education program. We just got a big grant from the European Commission, European Union, to work with uh, young people who are, have just arrived in Europe who are refugees, mu mainly Muslim refugees, and helping to integrate them. Social inclusion grant, working to um, build stronger 
communities where there's a lot of divide right now in Europe. Um, so we're expanding in Europe. We, we just started in Singapore. We're, we just started in Colombia. We're about to start in Turkey. So we're expanding around the world. And we have our One Billion Acts of Peace campaign. I believe we're going to reach that goal. And then I believe that the Nobel Peace Prize winners, you know, they're my bosses. I, you know, when Yvonne and I started this program, we don't, we're not on the board. We, we, we could be fired tomorrow without any reason, right? You know, it's Colorado, so you can fire anybody without any reason, and we we're just employees. We really wanted this program to be of, by, and for the Nobel Peace Prize winners. We wanted it to be their educational outreach program to the youth of the world. And I'm certain that once we hit a billion, they'll say, great, now let's go for 10. And then we have a film series, the Noble Legacy film series, which is really incredible. It captures the spirit and the essence and the cutting edge work of all of our Nobel laureates around the world. Um, people like the Dalai Lama or Desmond Tutu um, who are getting older and we want to capture them and their essence and their spirit for all, all time to share with people around the world as a continuing source of inspiration. And we've been nominated a lot of times for the Nobel Peace Prize. I was saying to uh, Jeremy that it's a little nerve wracking right now because we're getting phone calls at our house from the Norwegian Nobel Committee. And it's like, oh, you know, and so it's, it's, I think we're on the short list. I, I mean, or at least they keep calling. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens, but uh, yeah, it's wonderful for uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners to believe so strongly in this movement, and it's wonderful to see that um, it's being recognized internationally as well. And here's a, sh a shot from our Desmond Tutu film, beautiful film it's called Children of the Light, and the rest of the films in the series. So th that's what all I really wanted to share with you is that this work is going forward I don't know if you saw at the United Nations yesterday. A lot of things happened at the United Nations yesterday. Some good, some bad. But um, Governor uh, Brown of California was there, and he was talking about something good, which is that even though our president has decided to not implement the Paris Climate Accords, uh, cities and states and businesses and all sorts of people are getting together, and we're going to implement it. We're going to implement it ourselves. And so these are the kinds of citizen action, citizen mobilization. Um, working together, we can actually create the change that we want to see. And we're going to go ahead and just start doing it. We are doing it. We have 33 billion projects so far. And we're on our way to a billion. And hopefully, someday, our, our leaders will follow us. So that's what all I wanted to say to give you an overview of Peace Jam. Thanks. Thank you again for being here, Don. Making peace as a job just sounds like a dream job. <laughs> um, tell us about what, what about your job is the best part? I'm very hopeful. I get up every morning and I, okay, I read the paper and then I try not to get too upset, especially since the, the election. Um, it's been every day you read the paper and it's like, wow. Um, but, I work with incredible young people, and they're working to change the world, and they're full of hope, they're full of energy, they're full of enthusiasm, so I'm always optimistic. I see the best of everybody mm. every day. And laughter, I mean, like, I, I'm missing Yvonne right now because one of my favorite things about him is just being being together and just the light spirit that you guys bring. And not only that, but like the um, all the laureates that I've had the opportunity to, to meet, and it's, um, it's like a big part of, of the, the culture of Peace Jam. Like what, can you talk a little bit about the importance of laughter and just kindness um, in, in the everyday of what you do? Well, I think one of the things that Desmond Tutu said that we hold up as, as one of our key goals is never take yourself too seriously. Mm. And he laughs a lot. Yeah. When Desmond Tutu walks in the room, it's like, a champagne bottle, just the cork comes out and the bubbles fly out and it's like excitement in the air. He's just funny and laughing and goofing. And yeah, when he and Yvonne get together, it's nonstop. And we are always doing things to make it really fun. When we do a Peace Jam Youth Conference, 
um, maybe the theme is um, extreme poverty. It's a, it's a hard theme, but we start by doing uh, silly games and dancing and uh, <laughs> just really silly, goofy things. Um, and then we do something really serious. And then we do something really, really fun and we run around the room and um, uh, then we do something really serious. And so it, it, it's because it's, it should be fun to be working for change. It's exciting to be with a lot of other people who also care. I think that's the thing that blows the minds of most young people. It's so transformational because they know that they care, but they don't think maybe they're the only one. And when they're with 300, 400 of uh, young people they've never met before who are focused on working for change but are doing it in this exuberant way, it's, it's very, 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 very transformational. One of my favorite moments um, seeing Desmond Tutu was one of the kids asked him what it takes to be a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and he said, you have to have nice legs. <laughs> okay, he's very, he's very proud of his legs. <laughs> he says, you have to have a name that's easy to remember, like Tutu. You have to have a big nose like mine, and you have to have very sexy legs. <laughs> so these are our bosses. So yeah, it's, it's, we're goofing around all the time. I think I think so many of us want to be involved in world peace and like in the in this project, you know, especially. And I think some of the questions that always come up is just like, you know, where do you start? Um, I know we have key focus areas in the project. I mean, are there some examples that you can have where people can just do simple acts of peace today, get them logged, and get started with this project? That was the whole genesis behind the platform that we built together with the Google team. The idea is that people are good. They want to do something. They don't know what. They don't know how. Right? Or they feel like they're going to do it and it's not going to really make any difference. It's just going to be a drop in the ocean and it's not going to make any difference at all. So we've created the platform, billionax.org, where you bring people along. Um, you start as a tourist and then you become a traveler and then you become a guide. That we make it easy for you to do something really simple and then to um, look at other things that are happening in your area or in the issue area that you care about and you could replicate them or you could join them and then maybe you get to a place where you're doing a project of your own. But the concept that, that it's a continuum and that, that you don't, you're not expected to do any, anything big or fancy or hard when you start. It's just getting started. I'll give you an example. In Colorado, there's a city called Arvada that uh, wanted to do a volunteer challenge for a month. And they wanted to have 15,000 projects. And um, they had tried it the year before, and it was a big failure. And so they came to us and worked with us to use our platform. And we gave them a designated um, page. And they uh, knew that they could get the word out to Arvada that we're all going to work together as a community for a month. They knew they had uh, 35 different nonprofit organizations in their community um, who needed help, but they had no bandwidth, really, to go out and get volunteers to organize around this. It was too hard. And they knew that they wanted to capture what happened um, and have data so that they could show at the end the impact. But to set up their own website, they had tried the year before, and it was, it was really, they spent all their time just trying to build a website for this, and it, and it didn't work in the end anyway. So we were able to provide the, with our platform, we, we made the magic happen. We worked with the nonprofits, and they all signed up, all the different volunteer opportunities that were available. Um, we worked with the Chamber of Commerce and the city to get the word out to all of the volunteers. They had 35 different choices. There was a way that they could create their own projects, too, if they had something else that they wanted to do. And um, it, the goal was 15,000, and they hit almost 30. Thousand. So having our platform and connecting the people who have need, the nonprofits, with the people who have heart, the volunteers, and everyone wanting to work together in a community and have a combined impact, that's what we were able to do. So a lot of tools like that, were, that's actually turned out 
to be the, the real sweet spot for the campaign. When we first started working with the Google team, we were thinking we were going to be building something that was for individuals. As it turned out, what we built is something that's for power users. It's for businesses, for nonprofit organizations, for universities, for cities, um, high schools, doing elementary schools doing school-wide campaigns. Um, that's who have become our network members and our power users, and that's what's happening and, and how we're um, allowing them to take an idea or a desire that they have to, to make a difference and to create change and have their employees engaged in something powerful that's meaningful that they can measure the impact of and really being able to do it. One of the things I love most about this project is that it shows just how much peace there really is in the world. And I think, um, I mean, you look at like what's happening right now in Mexico City, um, we, talk, we were talking about that, this before. Um, you know, just today, there was, po there was probably in Mexico City a billion acts of peace happening just today, um, especially with seven billion people in the world. There's probably exponential number of acts of peace happening every day. What's the most difficult part of getting all of those acts of peace logged by the year 2020? I'm sure we won't log all of them. Our goal is to inspire um, many new acts to, to happen. So it's not just an aggregation, but it's also a, a different narrative, right? The, if you get up and read the newspaper every day, it just feels like things are horrible and the problems are overwhelming and what are we going to do? And, and you know, it's hopeless. You feel like a victim. You feel helpless, hopeless. I, I, I give up, right? Um, but the reality is that people are working together in a very effective ways and really creating positive change all over the world every day. And we hold up the Nobel Peace Prize winners as role models. We also hold up those who are doing good work as role models. And I'll give you one example. Um, there's a young man in India, his name is Harsh. He's 14. He read something in the paper about landmines um, between uh, up in Kashmir, um, between India and Pakistan, a lot of landmines, a whole lot of landmines are still there in the ground. And soldiers who are being blown up when they're trying to clear those uh, minefields. 14 years old, and he decides, I'm going to do something about this. And what he decides to do is he um, takes some drones. He had three drones. Um, and he retrofitted them, and I'm not an engineer, but he figured out a way to make the drones set up so they could fly over the landmines, detect them, and then drop a little um, device that um, it blows them up with, with only a drone around, no human beings, no dogs or anything like that, so that they, they could clear um, landmine fields. And so it's a wonderful project. He's a very smart young man. He deserves to be known about, right? So his project was logged on our site. We picked him as the winner of one of our hero awards. And every year in Monte Carlo, we have um, a big event. We have a premiere of one of our films. We have a Peace Jam Youth Conference. And we give awards to the projects in the world that are the best. And we always say that we treat uh, peacemakers like celebrities, and it, it really is fantastic uh, to be there and to see them get an international spotlight. Uh, he got a TED Talk. His project's been bought by the Indian government. I mean, you know, he's on his way. So being able to hold up people who are doing inspirational, incredible stuff around the world, and, um, and, and he's just 14 years old. You may say, oh, he's so much smarter than me. But then we have other people who are doing other things as well. So you don't have to have a PhD to start. You don't have to be brilliant to make a difference. You just have to have heart and soul and reach out your hand and help at least one other person. All of us can do that, regardless of our circumstances. And if we all did that, the world would be transformed. Mm, I agree. That's super powerful. And I think that this story about harm, it's interesting because this week at the United Nations, at the Social Innovation Summit, one of the things that was most talked about was using the power of technology for not only to innovate, but for like human progress versus just solely, you know, financial reasons. Um, there's sort of an urgency with all of that now, I think, especially... Um, with the climate that is changing, all the, especially all the hurricanes and things that are happening with the environment. Um, can you talk a little bit about the urgency in today's climate about a project like this? Well, absolutely. Uh, 
I was reading something in the New York Times yesterday about climate change. You know, break, well, we'll break it down for you. How bad is it? Bad is it? It's real bad. What can we do? Ooh, we better hurry. So if you want a good, um, really <laughs> very simple but clear breakdown of where we are, um, we've, uh, the world has warmed two degrees. If it gets up to eight degrees, it, we won't be able to support this amount of people at, at alive on planet Earth. So what does that mean? We're already seeing environmental refugees, people who where, the, where they live, it's flooded, it's a drought, it does, can't sustain life, wars will be fought. Um, many people will die from the extreme weather. We're seeing the extreme weather. We're, we're seeing the rising seas. I mean, it's already happening. We can't stop it from happening, but we can lessen the degree to which it happens if we act now. But we really have to take it seriously. And again, it's hard when our leaders don't lead, but we can lead ourselves. And that's our point, is um, coming together and, and, and then you don't feel like you're all alone. Like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm recycling. I turned off the lights when I left the room. You know, it's not gonna make any difference. The world's going to hell. That's the feeling that a lot of people have. And to have people be inspired and part of a movement and to be in, in, in community with others who are doing the same work, you don't feel lonely. You feel empowered. You feel excited. You feel enthusiastic. You know you're reaching goals. And that's that's what this campaign is all about. It's about unleashing goodness. We really, really believe that every single human being who's born on planet Earth has goodness in them and greatness in them, and we're unleashing that. And if we see ourselves in a different way, we can be empowered and we can be extraordinary agents of change. How do you see technology's biggest role in all of that, considering what we just talked about with the Social Innovation Summit? Well, again, I, the, the examples that I give from our campaign, there are people who want to do good. Um, they don't know how. They want to be part of a community. It doesn't exist. They want to create a campaign or a movement um, or a project. They need support. So it's, 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 it's providing the underpinnings f to make all of those things doable as opposed to sitting there by yourself feeling like, ah, it's too hard. So it's allowing people to get started, at least with the technology that we've developed um, working with Google. But I think in the broader sense, you know, we're talking about the example of the drones and the landmines. Uh, technology can be used for tremendous good. It can be used for tremendous evil. Um, so it depends on the uh, ethics of the people who are creating the technology. So I think that's also very important, too. So that's one of the reasons that we really care deeply about sharing these Nobel Peace Prize winners as um, moral examples for the world. Um, having an alternative narrative to the things that we're hearing um, so constantly that are so negative. Um, the most recent film that we did is called uh, Without a Shot Fired. It's about Costa Rica and how they made the decision 70 years ago to not have an army and instead to invest their money in healthcare, the environment, education, and housing. And the impact that had on, on Costa Rica and the rest of the world, and it's a choice. So we don't have to say that we're going to solve our problems with military force or by having a, a doubling of the size of our um, army or, you know, a lot of the things that you're hearing now, there, there are alternative ways to go about it. Uh, and different countries and different leaders have tried different approaches and they have worked. And so giving, a, a, having other voices heard. So we want to amplify the voices of our Nobel Peace Prize winners and of all, the, all of the young people and all of the others around the world who are doing things in a positive, nonviolent way. But we really, really believe in the path of nonviolence. There was a study that was just released that shows about working for change. And and if you use techniques of violence versus techniques of nonviolence. And nonviolence is the change that will last. It has the best chance of succeeding and it has the best chance of actually lasting and making a difference to, for social justice in that situation. So these are the, the stories that we're trying to share with the world. Um, one last question and then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, why youth? <sighs> I love working with young people because you and me both. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Even you know, if we started, P. Shem started because of some young people um, in a gang, right? Um, and Yvonne got into a conversation with them, and even the toughest kids, they 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 
they're like puppy dogs. So they have their heart and their soul is right here. And maybe it's buried under a few layers of trying to be tough, but they want to be loved. They want to belong. They want to matter. They want somebody to see the goodness and the beauty in their soul. That's what they want. And if you do that, they bloom like flowers turning towards the sun. It's incredible to see the change that happens with young people. Um, our program uh, starts at age six and goes through age uh, 25. Um, in the elementary schools, uh, you know, a lot of young people don't know that there is this thing called the path of nonviolence. You know, what, what, what do they say? There's the words that adults say, and then there's what adults do. So in the movies, what do we do when somebody does something that we don't like? You know, we go and bomb the hell out of them, right? You know, what, what does our government do where we're going to wipe North Korea off the map? You know, what, you know so you, you, you're, you're seeing the young people are smart, and they're, they're paying attention, and they're seeing all of these things, maybe the adults are saying nice words like, you know, be kind, but they're not being kind. And so they, you know, look at all of these role models that are being presented in media, in video games, in leadership around the world. And when they start studying the PCM curriculum, they're like, ah, there's something called the path of nonviolence. Like it's a huge discovery for them. And they, we didn't expect this, but in schools where our curriculum is being taught, one of the big impacts is um, on behavior because young people now have nonviolent role models. And they say, uh, the teachers say that they're in the playground and they're like, well, you know, Rigor Burdaman, she wouldn't do that. Or, you know, what would the Dalai Lama do? Um, so getting them positive role models who are solving really hard problems, but do using the path of nonviolence to solve them. Um, in elementary schools, there's something called an incident report when there's a fight. And in some schools, um, especially with schools that have a lot of uh, turnover, um, uh, transient populations of poor schools. A lot of our schools have a lot of you know, youth who are homeless or who are um, just uh, with job insecurity for their parents. There's a lot of moving. And so in those schools, it can be for teachers that they spend all of their time just trying to get everyone to sit down, be quiet, stop fighting, you know, pay attention, and very little time to actually teach. So in schools where the PCM program has been implemented, um, the incident reports of fights has gone way down, and the teachers have been really thrilled because they get to spend their time teaching and the young people are engaged. I almost hear too that it's like it's uh, they're inspired too not only by these Nobel Peace Prize winners but Nobel Peace Prize winners are going against the status quo, which is sort of probably also inspiring to someone who's a teenager and seeing things that might not make sense to them. Um, if um, if you do if you do reach those billion acts of peace, you said the next step would be ten billion acts of peace. Do you see sort of a, it's it's sort of this exponential curve. Do you see, and you hear all this white, you know, this white nationalism, like all these like weird things that are happening in our country. And that, that can sometimes be the story for us. But it's sometimes this exponential curve that you're seeing that we're actually the goodness is starting to come out. Do you think that once you hit the 10 or the 1 billion acts of peace, do you think 10 billion acts of peace will be a lot easier? Anything can become normal. Right? And I think that's what we have to be really careful about right now. Um, the kinds of things that white nationalists and racist and hate speech, and you know, there's, there are things that were maybe underground that have been legitimized in a way. They feel like they've been legitimized by our leadership at, in this country right now. And a lot of stuff's come out that um, is pretty concerning. And it, like it's OK to do. Um, certain things in certain ways. And peace can become normal too, you know? Kindness can become normal. Compassion can become normal. Anything can become normal. So it's, it's what we focus on and what we model ourselves. So that's the idea, really the core idea behind the Billion Acts of Peace campaign is that we have to work at scale. If we have seven billion people on planet Earth and we have a billion acts of peace, or and then 10 billion acts of peace. It's, it's changing, it's enough so that it can shift the consciousness worldwide and that we can see that there is another way and that it is a very successful way and that um, there's enough of it, there's enough of it happening in communities around the world. Um, we're in 145 countries around the world so far and just making it normal to 
reach out your hand to help someone else to be compassionate, to care, to act. Uh, you know, emotion without action is irrelevant. You know, you feel really bad when you see those stories about the people in um, the Rohingya being um, expelled from Myanmar. But they need help. They, they need compassion. It's good that you care, but they need people to actually help them. And some of it's social justice, some of it's humanitarian aid, some of it's um, legal rights. Uh, so we can create a different world. It's just that we give up our power. So that's the last thing I'll say, I'll end with that, is that we have the power in our hands to create whatever kind of world we want to create. We give our power away. And we vote once every two years, once out of every four years, and then we're done, right? And we just, oh, well, that's the way it is, and there's nothing I can do. And we need to take our power back as, as human beings who care and work together to create the world that we know that we want to see. We know we can do better than this. Come on, we can do better than this. And so we're not going to wait any longer. We're not waiting. We're creating that new world together. So um, we're just really, really grateful to you for being a member of our team and such a good friend, and to everybody at Google um, and YouTube who's been so incredible supporting us. Um, we have three wonderful executive sponsors, uh, Bradley Horowitz and Karen May and Susan Wojcicki. And um, it, it's just been a beautiful partnership. And I know it's going to continue to grow. So we're very, very, hap very, very happy to be in partnership with you all. And uh, thank you to everybody who came to this talk today. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you, guys.